Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Pryor, and I am the director of the Institute of Politics here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and we want to welcome you this evening to the forum. Here at the forum, we host guests who have made significant contributions to the world of politics and government and to our society. But tonight, the contributions and the achievements of the speaker that we are going to present, those contributions are truly remarkable. I wanted to welcome Paul Simon here tonight because he is an old and dear friend of mine. I had the high privilege of serving with him in the United States Senate. In fact, I sat right behind Paul Simon in my desk, and many an evening I had the high privilege of listening to him speak as I know I'm going to have that same high privilege tonight. I also want to give a special welcome to Paul's wife, Patty. Patty Simon, we welcome you and thank you for making the trip all the way from uh, Illinois to Cambridge, Massachusetts. People who know Paul Simon think in terms of his bow tie. <laughs> that might be his trademark. But many of you don't know how fierce of an advocate he has been throughout his whole public career. While he has supported fiercely education, liter literacy, and lifelong learning. Many of you students here tonight, I might add, may not be here had it not been for Paul Simon. For as a senator, he was responsible for the direct student loan program. I'm sure that after you graduate, you will still appreciate Paul Simon. <laughs> Here to formally introduce him is our good friend, the esteemed Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, D Dean Joseph Nye. Dean Nye, as you know, is the Don K. Price Professor of Public Policy at the Kennedy School of Government. He has served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs during the Clinton administration. And like Senator Simon, he too is a noted author. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dean Joseph Nye. Dean Nye. Thank you, David. And it is a pleasure to welcome Paul Simon back to Cambridge. Uh, Paul Simon was one of the original not quite original, but one of the early IOP fellows. So uh, we're delighted to have him back here. The aim of the Gustav Pollock lecture series is to bring to the Kennedy School speakers who will not only stimulate interest in government careers, uh, but also research that will build a better government. And the recent Pollock lecturers have included people like Casper Weinberger, Jack Kemp, and Tabo Vivecki. Uh, even at a glance, one can see that Paul Simon's long and distinguished career in the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives before that makes him a perfect fit for this series, and uh, we are very delighted to have him with us. Before he retired from the Senate in 1977, uh, 1997, sorry, uh, he was the senior senator from Illinois and with a reputation for exceptional constituent service, uh, his work in education and job, job training, training legislation was particularly important, and uh, his exceptional collection of bow ties that David mentioned was also well noted. Uh, before he went to the Senate, he spent 10 years in the House and had also served as Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. He's deeply committed to education and now teaches political science, history, and journalism at Southern Illinois' Carbondale campus where he founded and heads the school's Public Policy Institute. Uh, he is the author of 19 books uh, on topics as diverse as world hunger and dollar crisis and how to and why to get involved in politics. And he has been awarded no fewer than 54 honorary degrees. So please join me in welcoming Professor and Senator Paul Simon. I thank you very, very much. I thank you. I, I thank you very much, Dean Nye, and my longtime friend, uh, David Pryor. He didn't mention he was a United States Senator from 
the state of Arkansas. He did sit right in back of me. Whenever I didn't know how to vote, I would lean back and ask David Pryor how to vote. That's how I got all my bad votes in the U.S. <laughs> Senate. I, <laughs> no, seriously, he was, uh, it, he really epitomizes what a public servant ought to be. And uh, I was very proud to serve with him. And Dean Nye, you wrote an article, or a couple of articles, about the number of government workers who are going to be retiring soon. Uh, one of the contributions that an academic institution can make is to do research and point out needs like that. I didn't, I had no idea until I read that article. And uh, for those of you who are younger and a few, maybe very few who are my age here or so we'll remember a Joseph Nye who was a isolationist senator from North Dakota. And one point I do recall him introducing, probably with tongue in cheek, a measure to tax every American $10 per letter in his or her last name. And of course with the name Nye, N-Y-E, <laughs> You didn't, uh, the taxes would be limited. But Senator Schwellenbach from Washington objected <laughs> strongly to that. I, I remember that vividly. It's a pleasure also to be here in the state of uh, Ted Kennedy and John Kerry, your senators. I served in two committees with Senator Kennedy, one with Senator Kerry, both of whom uh, have done a, a very fine job of public service, and uh, I also recall didn't serve in the Senate with them, but uh, Paul Songus and Ed Brooke. I remember serving in the House with Paul, and he talked to me and said he was thinking about running against Ed Brooke, and I advised him against, and I said, I don't think you'd have a chance. You, my advice is generally very, very sound, as you can tell. Uh, I'm to speak about Congress in time of crisis. Uh, and obviously we're going through a period of crisis. First of all, we have become, at least temporarily, less partisan. And that can be healthy. What I have seen, what Dave Pryor has seen, over a period of years, an excessive amount of partisanship. Now, where we have genuine philosophical disagreements, we should be very open and candid about those disagreements. But simply because some poll ones might indicate we can gain a few points if we oppose this or support something, uh, that's not a sound basis for, for doing things. At the same time, we ought to be willing to differ and differ openly uh, if uh, we uh, have genuine differences. I thought Senator Byrd's comments on the floor of the Senate two days ago where he said we passed those appropriations on defense unanimously with no debate on the missile shield whatsoever. Uh, he said that was a mistake. And I agree with Senator Byrd. When you're talking about something that ultimately will involve an expenditure probably well in excess of $100 billion, which uh, uh, it's very, very questionable whether it can do anything to counter terrorism. We ought to be talking about that candidly. Congress is at least temporarily less partisan. I hope Congress can be more courageous. Uh, if I were to say there's one quality that is needed in uh, Congress and in administrations, it is courage. There is a tendency to pander. Whatever the latest polls suggest, that's the direction that we go. And uh, I think we're going to find in this crisis there are going to be answers that are needed that are not 
popular answers. We, we are going to have to be willing, among other things, to sacrifice. Bin Laden's interview with ABC uh, two or three years ago, in which he mentioned three factors, which he was critical of the United States. One of them was, he said, in Somalia, we learned when 18 American service personnel were killed, the Americans left Somalia. He referred to us as a paper tiger, unwilling to stand up, that we will run as soon as there is damage inflicted. Um, we're not going to preserve our liberties without sacrifice, and we have to be willing uh, to sacrifice. It's interesting that Monday's London Times has an article in which the author questions the uh, willingness of Americans to sacrifice. We've been willing to send bomb bombers over places and drop bombs, but that's kind of antiseptic in terms of possible American sacrifice. Uh, we're going to have to be willing to sacrifice. And the pandering, that's a problem that goes beyond this immediate crisis. Um, are we willing to stand up and do some things that may not uh, be popular? Uh, David Pryor worked, among other things, on Social Security. Social Security retirement, first years, we had 16 people working for each retiree. We're down to three for each retiree. We will, in uh, not too many years, be down to 2.3 per each retiree. Well, you don't need to be an Einstein to figure out we're headed for some problems. But the answers are not popular. There is no popular answer. And so both political parties in Congress have been ducking. Uh, we have to stop pandering. We have to tell people the truth. Don't go to a physician who tells you just what you want to hear. Don't go to a candidate for public office who tells you just what you want to hear. Um, let me mention two other domestic issues on, in this area of pandering. Um, we have more people in prisons per 100,000 than any other country on the face of the earth. Why do we have so many people in prison? Well, one of the reasons is that members of the Senate and the House and state legislative bodies don't want to have someone do a commercial that says you're soft on crime. And uh, Dave will remember this. We passed a bill, for example, to have capital punishment for chicken inspectors. Uh, I, I don't know that it would have harmed any of us to lose the votes of chicken inspectors in the United States, but we're not protecting students at Harvard and faculty members and even deans, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, in the, the same way. Um, and of course, part of the problem um, and the reason for, for crime uh, is the problem of poverty, which uh, uh, we, we pander not only the polls, but to those who are big campaign contributors. And uh, people who are poor are not big campaign contributors. Uh, I was asked to speak at the dedication of a library at a state university in Pennsylvania, and they asked me to, I've done a little work in the Lincoln field, they asked me to compare Lincoln's time and our time, well, of course, all kinds of differences radio, television, computers, automobiles. But one interesting comparison. In Lincoln's time, the great economic power was England. The great military power was England. And among the semi-industrial nations, the nation that had by far the worst slums was England. And we ask ourselves, how could this wealthy and powerful nation have tolerated that? Today, the great military power in the world is the United States. The great economic power in the United States, in the world, is the United States. 
and among the industrial nations, the nation that has by far the highest percentage of its children living in poverty is the United States of America. And 50 years from now and 100 years from now, people are going to ask of us, how could they have tolerated that? Um, well, we have, as I mentioned, we've been pandering. And, and to the big contributors, let me just use one illustration that I think Dave will remember. Uh, in conference, we, we get into conference committees when the House and Senate both pass bills on the same subject, but the language difference. And then you have to have a conference between the two bodies, and it's a small number. And then sometimes amendments get on that shouldn't get on. And uh, there was an amendment that was added uh, at the request of the Federal Express Company, uh, which uh, classified 40, and I have nothing against this company, just using the system, but it classified 40,000 truck drivers as pilots for labor management uh, relations purposes. Uh, it was not done for the truck drivers. But uh, the Washington Post reported that uh, they contributed $1.4 million in that two-year cycle to incumbent members of the House and Senate and campaign contributions. Three of us tried to get an amendment adopted to eliminate that, and we were badly outvoted. And then at a Democratic caucus, and I assume the same thing would have happened, Republican caucus, somehow I've never been invited to one of those, Dave. <laughs> but in the Democratic caucus, um, I got up and I said, maybe this amendment makes sense, but then let's have hearings. Let's have research done, and let's go about it in an orderly way. And one of my senior colleagues got up and said, Paul's always talking about special interest, special interest, special interest. He said, we have to pay attention to who's buttering our bread. And that's too often what it's about, uh, pandering. We also have to ask ourselves after this emergency, the public and Congress, why can people feel so powerfully motivated that they're willing to commit suicide to do damage to the United States of America? And I think one of the answers we have to recognize is that we have not been as sensitive to the international scene as we should be. We're 4% of the world's population. Uh, we have not been paying as much attention to the other 96% as we should. Right here on the Harvard campus, George Marshall spoke at a commencement in which he, and it, the, what he said made about the fifth paragraph of the Associated Press story, interestingly. But he proposed basically what became known as the Marshall Plan. And we led the world in response to poverty beyond our borders. And it was very courageous at the time. First poll taken after it was the program was announced showed 14% of the American public supporting it. Overwhelmingly unpopular. Because among other things, Harry Truman and George Marshall wanted to help the Japanese and the Germans who had just killed our brothers and, and sons. But as we look back, it was one of the uh, finest things that we've ever done, one of the most generous acts by any nation in the history of nations. But moving from that position of leadership, we now, if you take the percentage of our income that goes to help the poor beyond our borders, among the 21 wealthy nations, we are now 21st, dead last. Uh, the most needy area in the world is Sub-Saharan Africa. We're spending a little less than $800 million a year on assistance for Sub-Saharan Africa. That's two-thirds of what we get from one cent of a gasoline tax. Are we sacrificing to help people who really need help? Or let me give you another example uh, that I happen to get in involved in, and the 
uh, woman, Samantha Long, I think is her name, who heads the, one of the programs here on your campus, has a great article in uh, Atlantic Monthly in September about Rwanda and what happened in Rwanda. Uh, I chaired the subcommittee on Africa, and when, the, when we first got reports, six of us introduced uh, a resolution urging the United States to provide leadership in responding, but the administration took a stand against it. So uh, the, I got on the phone with Senator Jim Jeffords, who was the ranking Republican on the subcommittee. We called General Romeo Dallaire, uh, who was the Canadian general in charge of a small contingent of UN forces in Kigali. And General Dallaire said, if we can get 5,000 to 8,000 troops quickly, we can stop this slaughter. And Jim Jeffords and I got a uh, letter hand-delivered to the White House that afternoon urging that we call a Security Council meeting, that we act in response to that need. And, I, and we said, if we're unwilling to provide troops, let's at least provide transportation for the troops that would go to serve there. I waited and waited, no response. I called the White House and uh, I uh, was told, well, there just isn't a base of public support for doing anything in Africa. Awfully anemic response. It is partially accurate, however, and that means it's not just the administration that has to be looking at this, not just Congress, but the public at large. We're gonna have to pay more attention of things and that means looking long-term exchanges our Fulbright exchanges and other exchanges gradually going down in numbers that's not in the best interest of anyone in the United States or abroad students 480,000 international students on our campuses 1% of our students study abroad and two-thirds of them in Western Europe. We're gonna to have to modify some of the things that we do. We've closed embassies and consulates, saving a few dollars, but not doing the wise thing. And finally, let me just add each of us. Uh, I'm no longer in the Senate. I don't care what you do, where, where you are, student, faculty member, member of the community, each of us can do some small things and they have ripple effects. Uh, that's one of the things I'm really convinced of at the age of 72, that uh, these little things ultimately are the big things. And let me give you just one example. You will remember that uh, Lebanon had a civil war and it spilled over into uh, Israel's northern territory and Israel went into Lebanon, and then the Palestinian leadership that was in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, fled. They had a choice of going to Algeria, Libya, or Tunisia, and both Algeria and Libya were taking militantly anti-Israel positions, Tunisia a more moderate position, and for whatever reasons, they went to Tunisia. And about a year after they were there, and before the Oslo talks got started, uh, Chairman Arafat started making some positive noises. And Senator Harry Reid of Nevada and Senator Russ Feingold from Wisconsin and I flew to Tunis to meet with Chairman Arafat. And while we were there, we paid a courtesy call on uh, the president of Tunisia. And I said, I'm curious, Mr. President, why are you taking this moderate position, which is causing some criticism uh, by extremists in your country and your giant neighbors are unhappy with what you're doing. And he said, well, we don't talk much about this. And then he told about the difficulties his family had during World War II. And then he said, and a Jewish family took me in. A Jewish family took in a little Arab boy and may have changed history. We all change history. And what I want you to do is to change history positively. Thank you.
We now have time for questions, and there are two microphones on the floor and two microphones halfway up the stairs. So the people on the balcony will have to come down to reach those microphones. And Senator Simon has expressed willingness to answer questions. Um, I think we can raise any topic that, uh, that we want, but I'd like to make sure that they are questions and not speeches. Uh, so if you go to a microphone and have a question, uh, please identify yourself and your connection with the university, and then uh, we'll start up. Uh, if, since people haven't got to the mic first, maybe I'll take the advantage of, uh, of asking the first question if I can. A number of people have speculated that the uh, September 11th tragedy may have been a turning point not just in international politics, but in American domestic politics. Uh, if you look at the polls that showed a decline in confidence in government, uh, which were, people said about 65% said they had a great deal of confidence in government in the early 1960s, by the early 1970s, that had declined to about a third, and it stayed at a very low level until uh, just now. The Washington Post last weekend reported a poll that showed two-thirds of the people saying they had a great deal of confidence in government again. Uh, others were turning to a, a level we haven't seen in this country in 40 years. My question for you is, how long do you think that will last? Is this just the rally round the flag spike which will vanish, or will this be a turning point in domestic politics where we really will see a different attitude toward government, toward public service, and toward community in this country? I, I wish I could tell you I think it's a permanent thing. I do not. Um, and uh, uh, we, we are, are pulling together, obviously, at this point in Congress and in every community in this, this nation. You can, you can sense it um, everywhere. I think our problem uh, is caused in part, and, and incident, if I can digress, you ask the same question about confidence in government in Western Europe and in, and in Japan, we're below all the other countries. I think part of this is uh, due to the negative TV commercials. Uh, if you had uh, United Airlines running a commercial saying, don't fly American and show the crash in Little Rock, and Northwest running a commercial, don't fly United, shows a crash in Iowa, and Delta running a commercial saying don't fly TWA, showing the CIA mock-up of, of the TWA plane, pretty soon people would lose all confidence in the airlines. Uh, when you have candidates running against each other with negative commercials, and the polls show very clearly they're the most effective commercials. If I'm running against David Pryor, I have this commercial. I don't get on the, the um, in front of that camera or mic, but I have someone else. I, I have Joe Nye getting there at the service station, filling up the, his uh, car with gas, and this reporter's, reporter in, in quotes comes up and says, what kind of a guy is David Pryor? What kind of a guy is Paul Simon? And if he's doing my commercial, of course, I'm a great guy, and, and uh, David is just terrible, and, or the other way uh, around. Um, I, I think that is very much uh, a part of it. Part of it is also gets back to the question of courage that I talked about. People sense they're being pandered to by the leaders of government too much. I think we have to show some courage. and. Uh, when that courage is shown, while it makes it a little more difficult temporarily for candidates for office and for uh, public office holders, surprisingly, that trust level goes up. And uh, I think we need more backbone in public office. The uh, question in the balcony. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, Thank we you. <laughs> We've been having a lot of discussions in our classes about campaign finance reform, and it's been a very hot topic because some people say that it's just absolutely wrong that we have the system that we do now, or it seems like you were talking about um, 
people care about which side their bread is buttered on, and other people say that how do these guys stay in office? How else do they get the money to get elected in today's climate? So my question is, if you were to run for office, how do you keep your ideals intact without having to subjugate yourself to get all this money? Well, it is a huge problem, and it distorts our democracy. Why, why do we have 43 million Americans without health care coverage? Well, the 43 million Americans are not the campaign contributors. I, have a, I mentioned in one of the classes I spoke to today, a friend of mine, Gene Callahan, called me the other night, mentioned uh, that a waitress called him, she fell down, broke her arm, shattered the bone, and she called Gene Callahan and is calling other people she's waited on to ask to beg for money to pay for her medical bill in this wealthy United States of America. That shouldn't be. You know, if I have to pay 1% more in income tax in order to protect that waitress, I think I ought to be willing to do that. But the distortion comes from our campaign financing. And, uh, uh, and it affects everyone, everyone who holds major public office. I never promised anyone a thing for a campaign contribution. But when I was in the Senate, if let's say I ended up at a, at a hotel in Chicago at midnight. 20 phone calls waiting for me, 19 from people whose names I don't recognize. The 20th is someone who sent me a, a $1,000 campaign contribution. Well, at midnight, I'm not going to make 20 phone calls. I might make one. Which one do you think I'm going to make? Well, you know the answer. You feel, uh, you feel grateful to people who are generous enough and, and obviously wise enough to, uh, to contribute to your campaign. But that person who's out of work doesn't have the same access. People who make campaign contributions have access. We, we ought to change the system, just no question about it. But I don't think we're likely, though I have to, I was, was going to say, I don't think we're likely to do it until we get a really major scandal. Though the, what's happened is scandalous enough. But I would say to the credit of John McCain and his candidacy for the Republican nomination for president, he really elevated that issue. And uh, there is now, because of that, a little greater perception of the abuse that we now have. Charity, go ahead. It, I, I should remind you, introduce yourself, please. My name is Charity Bell. I, I'm an MPA one here at the Kennedy School. I and was where a, are you from? Tell me where you're from, each of you, too. I'm from Boston. Okay. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guinea, West Africa. I came back two years ago, and it was really amazing to me. I worked on HIV, HIV and AIDS education there. How unaware the U.S. was, and even Europe was, of the situation in West Africa and in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in general, in regards to the AIDS crisis. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what we can do in order to raise U.S. and Western awareness of what the situation is in emerging nations and what our role is in, in controlling and working on those crises. Well, the number one, we're working on research. That clearly has to continue. And uh, anything we can do in working with other nations, we should do. But in Africa particularly, those statistics are just astounding. You know, when a, in a country uh, like Botswana, where uh, t up to 26% of the population now is uh, identified as having the problem. They don't have AIDS yet, but they uh, have the virus. Uh, you know, it, it's just staggering when you look at some of those things. And, uh, and that, again, is tied in with uh, what we were t I was talking about before. The world has to see us as sensitive to the rest of the world. 
we have too often been insensitive, and you just mentioned one example. And that insensitivity has come across to many people as arrogance. Uh, Senator Simon, uh, it's an honor to be asking you a question. My name is Dal Lamagna. I'm with the Mid-Korea Program at the Kennedy School um, from Long Island, New York. I, I want to take us back to campaign finance reform. A lot of people think that because of Buckley, Buckley versus Valero, where rich people can spend all the money they have running, that we need a constitutional amendment that allows federal, state, and local governments to limit money spent on campaigning. Do you agree with that? And if you do, do you think it's possible? Do you think our Congress would give us that? Do you think the states would go along with it? First of all, uh, Senator Hollings from uh, uh, South Carolina introduced such an amendment. We had a vote on the floor. I don't remember how many of us voted for it, but not very many. Uh, uh, if you ask me in theory, I'm for it. I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, Buckley versus Vallejo, you can get around rather easily. Uh, and uh, let me mention two approaches. One, by the state of Nebraska on its legislative races. The state of Nebraska has a unicameral system. And they limited the uh, legislators to spending $73,000. But if you, and, and you had to do that voluntarily, which you could do that under Buckley versus Vallejo. And if you spent more than that, then the state of Nebraska would give your opponent the matching whatever you spent above that. And I understand in this last election, one legislator from Omaha uh, exceeded that amount. But in the previous three elections, no one exceeded that amount. It's a kind of an interesting experiment. Uh, the second thing we can do is uh, on the bill that Senator John Kerry introduced. And uh, the, that bill said, you know, we're going to limit what can be spent uh, in a state like Illinois. My last campaign, I spent $8.4 million. This was 1990. The most recent campaign, the successful candidate for senator spent $17 million. You know, it just keeps going, going up. Uh, John Kerry would limit the amount spent, would uh, pr provide free airtime and TV time uh, for candidates, uh, and, and the candidate himself or herself would have to be on the, on the camera so you'd have much less of the negative kind of campaigning, and not just 30 seconds, but in two or three minute uh, segments. And, uh, and then, like in the state of Illinois, uh, it would go by population, Illinois would get about $2 million, and uh, if we spent, if any candidate spent more than that, then the federal government would match the amount above that. And I think you will find rarely that candidates, if you have a Michael Huffington, like in California, who spent $28 million, I doubt that he would have spent $28 million if he had known his opponent was going to get $28 million from the federal government to match that. So I think there are ways around, I think the decision was an unfortunate one. Uh, as you read the decision, it is not as decisive as most Supreme Court uh, opinions are, but I doubt that it's going to be reversed in the near future, but I think we can get around it. Right off me. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Clear. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts, and uh, I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard University. Um, Senator, you mentioned in your speech um, the need for the United States to be more sensitive in the international arena in relation to the events of uh, September 11th. Um, I was wondering if you think that there's ever going to be a public acknowledgement of uh, th these needs, and um, what do you think some good steps are um, in, the, in the effort to reform some of our foreign policies? Public acknowledgement, and you forgive me, I wear hearing aids, I have a little bit of a hearing impairment. Public acknowledgement of what again? Of the problems that our foreign policy has been causing. Yes. Well, uh, I don't know that we need a uh, public apology, but we do need to face up to things. Ronald Reagan, uh, for example, uh, not a wild-eyed liberal, uh, Ronald, uh, Ronald Reagan suggested that we devote 1% of our national income, our GDP, to helping the poor beyond our borders. We're devoting now about one-seventh 
of 1% of our GDP to helping the poor beyond our borders. And, uh, and it's just in general, let me give you, well, I've done some work on the water problem. I, I wrote a book about it and was over in, uh, at the request of the State Department, Patty and I were over in, in Jordan and Syria uh, about eight weeks ago, meeting with the leaders there, trying to get them to work with Israel and the Palestinians on, on a regional approach to water. The, the water problem is going to really be an explosive problem for us before long. But UNICEF says 9,500 children a day die because of poor quality water, easily preventable deaths. 9,500, that, that, you know, that's a statistic. But that's 630 times as many as were killed at Columbine High School. We were startled by Columbine High School. And today, October 3rd, 2001, 630 times that many children die, easily preventable deaths because of poor quality water, and we pay no attention to it. 9,500 is a fourth more than were killed in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania on September 11th, and we're not paying attention. Uh, we simply have to become more sensitive to the rest of the world, and I want you to be part of making us more sensitive. My name is Rob Verratti. I'm a prospective undergraduate student from Florida. Senator Simon, do you think that the U.S.'s decision to try to support the United States or to support the Northern Alliance against the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, despite the Northern Alliance's bad record on human rights, would be an example of the United States' willingness to turn its back on foreign policy in order for the best political expediency, or is it a necessary evil? Well, you're asking a question that I don't have the answer for. Um, what I think our response should be is a firm but measured response, a response that does not involve killing a lot of innocent people, even though that may satisfy a, a passion in our people at this point. And I would say to the credit of President Bush up to this point, he and his administration have been measured in their response. And I particularly thought his speech to Congress where he talked about Islam and the Muslim world and visiting the mosque that day uh, was an important thing. Uh, we, we do not want a repetition of what we did to the Japanese Americans in World War II and some other experiences that we have had but precisely how we respond. I don't have uh, all the information that the administration has or members of Congress have today. David Pryor and I are has-beens. Uh, <laughs> you, you're not a has-been, okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, so I can't specifically answer your question about what I think we ought to be doing. Uh, good evening, Senator Simon. Uh, my name is Dan Craig. I'm a sophomore in the college and a proud Illinoisian. Uh, <laughs> Where are you from in Illinois? Uh, just outside Chicago, Arlington Heights. Yeah, you're oh. clearly an outstanding member of this audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, during uh, sort of the tail end of your service in the Senate, you were known as an outspoken critic of the nomination of Clarence Thomas. Uh, this summer, some new revelations came out that David Brock, the author of uh, The Real Anita Hill, had fabricated much of the book and sort of maligned her character unfairly. Do you think this is sort of indicative of uh, an increasing amount of acrimony in, in national politics these days? Oh, no, I don't. Uh, I think, you know, this is just one journalist who did uh, uh, acted irresponsibly. Uh, it is uh, it's kind of interesting. He was doing some writing for the American Spectator and interviewed me and then had quotes that just were clearly fabrication. And I told my press secretary, I said, I, I don't want to talk to him again. It's the only reporter I've ever 
uh, said that about. And he requested to talk to me when he was doing his book, The Real Needy Hill. In that book, he, he uh, says that uh, I, uh, uh, well, he quote, said both, both Ted Kennedy and me as having uh, uh, opposing Clarence Thomas because Judge Patricia Wald, a federal judge, uh, didn't get along with Clarence Thomas, and Ted Kennedy and I had a, an, in quotes, a close relationship with Judge Patricia Wald. Well, uh, implying that we, uh, you know, things were fairly <laughs> cozy. Uh, well, I, I, as a matter of fact, I had never met Judge Patricia Wall. And uh, uh, about six months before I left the Senate, I was testifying before John McCain and John Glenn and waiting for them to, to the chairman to show up. And I was sitting in the witness chair and this woman tapped me on the shoulder and said, I thought I should introduce myself uh, since you and I have a close relationship. Uh, I'm Judge Patricia Wall. Uh, uh, the answer is uh, there always have been a few irresponsible journalists and there will continue to be a few irresponsible journalists, but I don't think we can make sweeping generalizations on that basis. Good evening, Senator Simon. My name is Chris Gibson, and I'm a first-year MPP student from, uh, originally from Texas, but don't worry, I'm not Republican. Um, I was, you've, you've spoken a lot tonight about courage and long-term thought and policy making, and, I'm, and you've brought up the example of uh, the incidents, or the Congress basically allowing the missile defense shield to pass through. And I was wondering, how you would characterize and whether you would use courage and uh, long-term thinking to describe um, similar efforts to let some of the um, some countries like India and Pakistan who have nuclear capabilities um, in some ways uh, well I'm wondering if you think it's a good idea to ease sanctions on countries like that if we're trying to look out for the long-term benefit of I guess the planet really yes well obviously we face a very delicate situation with Pakistan today. Uh, we did uh, cut off the delivery of some weapons to Pakistan. Uh, the, uh, that whole area is, uh, is very complicated, but I, my impression, and I've visited in that area on several occasions, my impression is that you're not going to have stability between Pakistan and India until you solve the, 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 the nuclear question. And that has to involve China also. Uh, and I think the United States and Russia in combination have to provide leadership in pulling those nations together. I think it is possible to work out uh, an agreement to get rid of nuclear weapons in those three countries and to stop all testing in those three countries. And then some of the uh, delicate areas like the Kashmir situation, I think can be worked out. But there is, there is fear right now, in my opinion, excessive fear, but that's easy for someone from the United States to say. But you talk to leaders in India, they're worried about Pakistan, and they cite all the reasons for where you talk about leaders in Pakistan, they're worried about India, and they cite all the reasons. You have to bring that down, and I think the big overall uh, question that, that, that the, the dark cloud is the nuclear cloud, and we're going to have to provide leadership on that. Uh, thank you, Senator Simon. Uh, my name is Wynne Wasson. I'm uh, an undergraduate here at Harvard, and I'm from North Central Illinois. Where? Uh, Dixon. Where? Dixon. 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 Oh, yes. A fellow named Ronald Reagan lived there for a while. Yeah. 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 He didn't, we didn't choose him, so. Uh, <laughs> but um, my question is, uh, you mentioned earlier your work on the, uh, on the, uh, on the water shortage problem, the, uh, the issue of a looming water shortage. My question is, uh, given the events of September 11th, how do you think the scope of how international organizations and how nations work with each other uh, will be uh, changed either by encouraging cooperation or by, or by hindering it as far as dealing with such 
upcoming issues such as the water crisis? I think there is a possibility that some good may come out of this horrible tragedy. One is that we're going to be more sensitive to other countries. And then we're not going to just unilaterally, uh, without, and just looking at the domestic scene, decide what we're going to do. Uh, and this has happened under both Democratic and Republican administrations. For example, are not going along with outlawing the, the production and use of landmines. Uh, other countries can't understand it. I can't understand it. Uh, I think we should have uh, gone along. Just uh, in recently at the United Nations, where they met on small arms, the illegal sale of small arms uh, from one country to another. And we announced that we could not go along with it because, and, and supposedly 500,000 people a year are killed with these illegal uh, small arms sales. We could not go along with it because agreeing to the treaty would violate the Second Amendment to our Constitution. Well, any third-rate lawyer will tell you there's just nothing to that at all. That kind of thing has to become a thing of the past. We're going to have to work with other nations. And the water situation is clearly one of those. Uh, the World Bank says 300 million people a day live in areas of serious to severe water shortage. 25 years from now, it will be 3 billion. 300 million is not necessarily volatile. 3 billion is explosive. Uh, the intelligence agencies reported, uh, as they do to the president periodically, reported President Clinton in one of his last months in office, uh, projecting where we're going to be 15 years from now. And they said 15 years from now, the great resource shortage will not be oil, but water, and there will be regional wars over water. Uh, well, there, it's not necessarily the truth that we're going to have regional wars over water. But if we don't do something, that will happen. In, in Amman, Jordan, I mentioned being in Jordan and Syria, you turn on the tap one day a week right now, uh, capital city of, of Jordan. They're going to increase their population by one third in the next 10 years. Uh, that problem is going to get worse. Uh, Egypt gets 98% of its water from the Nile. 85% of the Nile comes from Ethiopia. Ethiopia has one of the highest birth rates in the world. They're going to double their population in the next 20 years. Those two nations are on a collision course unless we do something. And that means the United States leading uh, on research, among other things, on desalination, and, uh, and pulling nations together. Um, and, and one other point, and I'm taking too long at your question. One of the real problems is monitoring agreements that are reached. Um, Jordan doesn't trust her neighbors. Israel doesn't trust her neighbors. Syria doesn't trust th th those two and doesn't trust Turkey. Uh, and they're not going to trust technicians from e either country. Uh, if, there, if we can get regional agreements, there will have to be international technicians who will come around and monitor uh, not just river flows, uh, but you have not only shrinking rivers, but you have uh, declining aquifers. Aquifers become even much more complicated to monitor. Hello. My name is Edita Tahiri from Kosovo, and I am a KCG. From where? From Kosovo. Kosovo. And I am the mid-career student at KCG here. Uh, you have been uh, speaking about Marshall Plan applied in Germany and uh, Japan after the Second World War. And as we know, the Balkan has been going through the wars in, la in past 10 years, and most bloodiest to be the Bosnian and Kosovo War. And we all see now that the recovery process, it is really very difficult. We have their uh, Pact of Stability and some other programs for, for recovery, but they are not meeting the expectations. So would you be thinking about kind of new Marshall Plan for applying to the region in terms of making Southeastern Europe be more quickly integrated into the transatlantic community. Thank you. Yeah. 
I would love to see a Marshall Plan, not just for the United States, but Western Europe, obviously, should be part of that. Uh, and your area is an example of where we have to be providing greater opportunity for people if we're going to have peace and stability. The other problem, if I may speak candidly about your area, and I headed the international team monitoring the presidential election in, in Croatia three years ago. And I always remember this man who came up to me from in the streets of Zagreb. I had these television cameras following me, so he knew I had something to do uh, outside of uh, the Zagreb situation. And uh, he said, we want Croatia to be part of Western Europe. And I said, I want you to be part of Western Europe, but you're going to have to have free and fair elections, and you're going to have to get rid of some of your ethnic strife. And he said, well, the Serbs killed my brother, and I'm going to get even. And I said, if you do that, what do you think the Serbs are going to do? And of course, I didn't convince him. But uh, uh, I think we should do everything we can to be of assistance. I also think the people in your area have to do whatever they can in the way of leadership to pull people together, to gradually reduce the ethnic strife, uh, strife that is there, uh, that is awfully discouraging to a visitor uh, in your area. We have time for two more questions if they're brief. I will do this microphone. We have to end at this microphone because there's somebody wearing a Paul Simon button. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me just say, I met the, this young man at an earlier class today. His name is Clay Pell. He is the grandson of Claiborne Pell, our former colleague in the United States Senate. You asked me to mention that, and I you said I would do that. I did not ask you to mention that, but <laughs> thanks for the introduction. Um, I want to ask, how realistic do you think it is to expect substantially greater support for the poor and suffering abroad? And secondly, how can we ensure that such efforts aren't seen as very arrogant by people abroad. And finally, as a student, what can we do to see that more is done for the poor in other countries? If I can take that last question first, because this really is important, if I can address the students particularly, I hope you can do some brainstorming on how we do this. You know, we, if we have a meeting in Seattle, you can get young people out to throw stones and do all kinds of things. But when I, for example, when I speak to a UN association meeting, people there are my age. I don't find young people there. How do we get young people interested in seeing to it that we respond to the woman who asked about the problem of AIDS in Africa? You know, that ought to challenge us. Uh, how do we respond to poverty and around the world, I, 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 somehow we have to generate some enthusiasm. I see m my friend Bob Giles back there who heads the, the, the Neiman program. We need media people who are going to challenge us. But I would love, it, can I give you an assignment? Sure. <laughs> All right. Could you get together? with about six or eight of your friends some evening and just brainstorm on the question, how can we get more young people interested and involved in international affairs? There's so many things that could be done. Uh, I remember reading when um, Barbara Ward, who wrote uh, a lot on this whole food and population in the world problems, and she mentioned being at a meeting in Geneva, and uh, the, one of the, our former colleagues said to her, well, the churches have adopted some resolutions to help the poor beyond our borders. And the senator uh, said, uh, I'll let you know when I get the first letters from them. And uh, she said, I didn't receive uh, any letter from him. Just simple things, right? Like writing letters, but also showing uh, showing real interest. How do 
how does the National Rifle Association get its power when clearly the majority of public opinion is on the other side? Well, they are dedicated. They write letters. They show up at town meetings. They do the things that we have to do in a democracy to have their voices heard. We need your voice. Now, I, you had, I probably am taking too long on that question already. That, uh, what was the issue? Well, our last okay. question. Thank you very, very much. But, and Thank then you. We'll work after, you, when you, after you have that meeting, can you send me a report on your meeting? <laughs> we'll send you a report and a request. <laughs> our last question here. Uh, it's an outstanding button uh, that you have. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's, um, my name is Joanna Bryson. I'm from Carroll Stream, Illinois. Um, but I was going to ask about, the, in the last election, I was out um, trying to get the vote out in northern Ohio, actually. Um, and one of the problems I ran into a lot was people just being confused, you know, saying, I don't know what to think out of the, not just from the TV commercials, but not even knowing where to vote. I mean, I guess it's a question about engagement. Do you have any idea how to engage people? This is something related to what you just talked about. but. This isn't just young people. These are people who had voted for 40 years, but no longer feel like they understand all the, the issues on the ballot. Uh, my advice to candidates would be stand for something clearly so the American public can know where you are. What we're doing now is we take polls, and the polls obviously show the same thing, whether you're a Democratic candidate or Republican candidate, and you, you start moving toward where the polls are. Uh, I don't think that you get leadership that way. I, I think, uh, just using the example of, of health care, and I know my friend Al Gore is going to be here tomorrow night, and he talked about, you know, getting, by the year 2006, getting children under the age of 12 covered by health care. Uh, you know, I, I think you have to do more than that. I think you have to say, we want to cover everyone. And it's going to take a little sacrifice on the part of all of us to do it. And But this is what we have to do. Uh, I think if candidates clearly stand for something, you end up with uh, a much bigger turnout. Um, I, I ran for the United States Senate in 1984, as you may remember. Uh, and uh, uh, we end up, and my opponent and I had some pretty differing views on things, but we ended up with uh, an unusually high percentage of people voting in the Senate race. Uh, not quite as many as voted for president, but almost as many. And I think in part is because both my opponent and I stood for something. Uh, people want some clarity and when you talk about confusion I think there is too often is some confusion so uh, a little backbone would help in getting a greater turnout on the part of the public let me uh, finally just thank all of you for being here let, let me close with one one story I always got one more story and then I will stop here Gina, I'm sorry uh, the, uh, many of you will remember when the state of New York had a uh, United States senator named Jacob Javits. And uh, he was a very remarkable senator, as David knows. But, uh, uh, and he lost an election in New York. And shortly after he lost, it was discovered he had Lou Gehrig's disease. And Jack was a, he would swim every morning at 8 o'clock. Very vigorous person. You could just see him declining. And about eight weeks before he died, he was wheeled into my office, and uh, he had a device on his chest to keep him breathing, and, we, and it was plugged into the wall, and uh, he started lobbying me on a bill that he was interested in. And uh, when he finished lobbying me, I turned to him and I said, uh, Jack, you're an inspiration. And I'll never forget his response. He said, Paul, you have to have a mission in life. I think that's true, and part of our mission is to build a better world. And each of us, by doing small things, can help build that better world. Thank you. Please join Very me in thanking you.
Patty, with your permission, I'm going to tell one final story on Paul that I, I've been telling around all day. I told it in class this morning. It's a true story. In, uh, yeah, he said, which is unlike most of my stories. Um, I'm going to make this very quick. I won't embellish it. October 1996, Paul Simon was just about to cast his last vote in the United States Senate his last vote of his public career. So a couple of days before that, I said, you know, we need to recognize this guy some way. So I picked up the telephone, D9, and I called up a man in Little Rock, Arkansas. His name is Bill Humble. He is a tie manufacturer. In fact, he made this tie right here, I think. LaBille's. If you ever had a LaBille's tie, they come from Little Rock. So buy them all. Okay. I said, Bill, I need a hundred bow ties. And he said, okay. So the next day I looked up, here comes the Federal Express truck, a hundred bow ties. I go to our friend Connie Mack in the Senate, our good Republican friend from Florida, and I said, Connie, I'm going to give you some bow ties for your Republican colleagues. I'm going to take these bow ties for my Democratic colleagues. And sure enough, when Paul Simon walked into the Senate for his last vote, on that October evening, 1996, 100 members of the United States Senate, in his honor, Republican and Democrat alike, had on their bow ties honoring this fabulous American. Paul Simon, thank you for coming. <laughs>